Well, we are so privileged to have our good friend Bishop Robert Stearns with us this morning. Um, great to welcome him back to Harvest Time uh, and his first time ministering to us in our new auditorium. Uh, bishop Robert is the overseeing bishop of the Full Gospel Tabernacle in Buffalo, New York. Uh, that's where our friend Pastor Tommy Reed pastored for 50 years um, and passed the baton on to Bishop Robert. Um, and it's a church that for decades has really been on the cutting edge of what God is doing, not only in our country, but, but really around the world. Uh, Bishop is the founder of Eagle's Wings Ministries. Uh, Eagle's Wings has been used in a very unique way. In fact, I really don't know another ministry that has been used like Eagle's Wings to connect believers here in the United States with the Jewish people, um, with the Israeli state. And God has given Robert tremendous favor um, with the national leaders of Israel and um, an opportunity to express the love of Jesus uh, to the Jewish people. Um, Robert is hosting tonight uh, a special event here at 6 o'clock. Connecticut celebrates Israel. And we have the people of God coming together with the Jewish people of God. And it's going to be such an exciting celebration. We're going to have believers uh, in Jesus. And we're going to have many Jewish friends. Uh, Rabbi Mitch from Temple Shalom here in Greenwich is coming this evening. He's going to bring, be bringing a word of greeting. The deputy consul of the state of Israel uh, is coming tonight uh, to share a message with us. I um, want to encourage you, put on your Jewish dancing shoes. We're going to be singing, dancing, celebrating, and having great time. Um, you know, this is the first time ever at, at harvest time that we've had a gathering where Jewish friends and believers in Jesus, in Yeshua, are coming together for one event. And I believe it's going to be a, a tremendous night tonight. Um, at the end of the service today, Robert is involved with a lot of projects in Israel, reaching out to the Jewish people in love. And at the end of the service today, we're going to have an opportunity to sow into a very special project uh, that he's working on in Jerusalem right now. And so I want to encourage you to open your heart to that. Just want to remind you, in your bulletin, um, there is a, a little um, form to fill out with your information. Robert uh, hosts a, a day a year uh, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And if you'd like to receive updates about what God is doing, um, you can write down your information. This is to go on the Eagle's Wings contact list. There's a table out in the main lobby. And if you'll drop off this form at the table, there's a book by Pastor Jack Hayford um, that we'd like to give you about how to stand with Israel. I'm wondering, would you stand on your feet this morning and give your best welcome for our friend, Bishop Robert Stearns. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Shalom. Now, before you're seated, before you're seated, I'm going to give you your Hebrew lesson for the day, all right? Because how many of you know it's Hanukkah right now? We're in the middle of Hanukkah, so the timing of this could not be better. So uh, there's a variety of ways that you could say it, but we'll go, we'll, go, we'll go simple this morning. Now, this will impress the rabbi and the Jewish friends who come tonight. So I'm, gonna, I'm giving you the inside scoop so you're ready for tonight, all right? So what we're going to do, we're going to... Any good Hebrew accent, just clear your throat, and you're halfway there, all right? Because that's... So we're going to say Hag, Hag, Sameach, Hag, Sameach. This is a brilliant congregation, Pastor Glenn. So Hag, Sameach means happy holiday. Hag is a holiday, a Hag or a Hagim, the plural Hagim. Sameach is joy, joyful, Simcha, joy. Uh, so may you have a joyful holiday. Hag Sameach. So turn to your neighbor behind you and practice. Go ahead. Wish them a Hag Sameach and bless them. You are doing great. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. It is so good. It is so good to be back home at harvest time. And uh, I've missed you all and I'm excited um, to be back with you. 
Uh, I've been here many, many times over the years, and we've also had different ones of our staff, like Ryan Delling and Sarah and others who've connected over the years. And, um, but it's my first time that I get to be here in the new facility, and can we thank God for what he's done bringing us in to this amazing new facility, so exciting. But the truth of the matter is, I, I cannot lie, uh, the new building, Celebrate Israel, all that, I'm really here to see Ginny. That's why I'm really this lady right here. Pastor's mom. Pastor's mom has been one of our prayer partners and supporters for ever. I don't know. I mean, 30 years this lady has prayed for me and, uh, and been a part of us. I love you. She is a gem. I'll tell you that. You're blessed. Well, I'm excited to be back and to see all that the Lord is doing and to spend um, this great um, day with you as we rejoice and uh, learn uh, what the Holy Spirit is speaking and saying to us, um, you know, in this generation. A couple quick things I want to mention uh, briefly. Pastor mentioned the table in the back. Um, I don't want to take a long time on this, but I do want to briefly mention some of the materials that are back there. Uh, as Pastor has mentioned, uh, in 2004, <clears throat> uh, Pastor Jack Hayford and Pat Robertson and I worked together uh, with Ariel Sharon, who was uh, the Prime Minister at the time, and we instituted the Global Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem. Would you say first Sunday of October? You know, Psalm 122.6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is not a metaphor. Amen. It's not an idea. It's not just this thing that we say, well, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but really that means whatever. It's a real place. Amen. It's a real city. There's real people, real problems. And, and so we instituted this day of prayer gathering the body of Christ globally on the first Sunday of every October. Currently, we have 1,700 major global leaders who've endorsed this move. Everybody from uh, Joyce Meyer to Ravi Zacharias to the main leaders of the body of Christ all around the world. And they gather together in churches and in convention centers and all around the world on the first Sunday of every October. Uh, our materials are translated into 39 languages. We have coordinators in 174 nations around the world. And the estimates that we have from field reports are that there are about 90 million people participating every first Sunday of October. We broadcast live out of the city of Jerusalem. There we have an amazing event. This year, Michael Oren uh, was our uh, speaker. He's the deputy prime minister. Uh, he was just with us just six weeks ago there in um, Jerusalem. So if you would like to become a part of praying for the peace of Jerusalem, not just as an idea, but as a reality, just fill this out. And as uh, Pastor mentioned, there's a free book in the back from Pastor Jack, my pastor, that we will get into your hands. There's other materials back there as well. A lot of you over the years have enjoyed my worship ministry, my CDs. Those are all available back there. I'm not going to be singing this morning, but I will sing a little bit tonight. i got to get you to come back, so you're going to sing tonight. All right. Um, some of the books that are mentioned are there back there. I'm going to just mention two of them. Um, this book has gone all over the world. In fact, someone told me that there's a good-sized Brazilian contingent in the church. Is that accurate? All right. My Brasilenos, that's right. We have just opened an office in Brazil. Eagles Wings Brazil has opened this year. I've been there twice this year. I'm going back again in March. And uh, this book, The Cry of Mordecai, Awakening an Esther Generation in a Haman Age. The amazing thing is that the headlines around the Middle East really have not changed in 3,000 years. They really haven't changed in 3,000 years. There is an irrational hatred of the Jewish people. There is an irrational hatred of the Jewish people, especially when they're in the physical land of Israel. And the enemy just keeps reproducing himself generation after generation. 
But now God is raising up the church to stand with Israel and with the Jewish people. And that's what this book is all about. You can pick that up in the back. This was just translated into Portuguese, and uh, uh, we are getting ready to... In fact, I'll mention this one briefly. I wasn't going to mention this, but this was exciting. I just got back from the Czech Republic. Um, I was there in June. I was in the Czech Republic in June, and uh, we're working very close with the parliament there, and they translated this book, No, We Can't, Radical Islam, Militant Secularism, and the Myth of Coexistence. Uh, they translated this. In fact, this was forwarded by a good friend of yours, uh, Senator Joseph Lieberman, uh, who wrote the foreword for this book. Uh, and they just translated this into the Czech language, and they presented it uh, personally to every single member of the Czech parliament. There was a reception. Uh, you can go on our website and see all of the pictures. And it was just about a month or six weeks after that uh, that the Czech president went to Israel and declared openly that they are in the process of moving the Czech embassy to Jerusalem, which we are praying for and so excited about. So that is back there also. <clears throat> and then finally, the last one I want to mention, if you're there and you say, what is this Israel thing? Listen, it's Christmas. This is a Christian church. Why are we talking about Israel? What is this all about? If you're on that journey trying to figure it out, our Watchmen on the Wall curriculum, this is a curriculum we wrote to give a very basic introductory understanding to give you vocabulary, reference points from history, from modern times. If you're saying, what, what's the problem over there? What's the 48 border? What's the 67 border? You know, who is Fatah? What is this all about? You know, uh, you know who is Hamas and what is Hamas and what's the difference? If, <laughs> if that's where you're at on your journey and you're trying to figure it out, this is a great resource for you. This is in 12 languages. We've had about 90,000 people through this course around the world, and that is available to you there in the back as well. Amen. All right, would you turn, please, in your Bibles <clears throat> uh, quickly to wherever the Holy Spirit leads you. And, um, but end up, please, in Amos, the book of Amos. We're going to look from chapter 9 this morning. And I want to just say briefly, um, as we begin and as you're turning there, I know that you already know this and you're aware of it, but you are an amazingly blessed congregation to have Pastor Glenn and Denise leading this house. The incredible faithfulness and integrity of this couple. Um, you know, when you've been in ministry, I've been in full-time ministry now for 87 years. And uh, you, see, you see folks come and go. Uh, you see things that just appear for a moment and then disappear. This is a ministry family who have given themselves to the kingdom of God. They've given themselves to the building of this local house. And you are massively blessed to have them. And we love you very, very much. Amen. Well, we're going to look, please, <clears throat> in the book of Amos. And uh, chapter 9, uh, we'll look at verse 11. And then for time's sake, uh, I will skip a verse or two and go down and look at verse 14. And 15, I am stalling because there it is. All right. Amos 9, 11 to 15. In that day, would you say that day? In that day, I will raise up the fallen tabernacle of David. I will restore its broken places, raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old. Verse 14. And I will bring back my captive people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards, drink wine, make gardens, eat fruit. I will plant Israel in her own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, declares the Lord who will do these things. Let's pray. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we turn our hearts to you today, and we ask for illumination from your word that would change our lives. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. I'd like to begin this morning and let you know a little bit of my journey and how I came to be here. Um, first of all, I am not Jewish. This is a common misconception in the body of Christ. Uh, people hear my last name, it sounds Jewish. Uh, they know I'm in Israel all the time, and they think that I have Jewish heritage or Jewish roots or come from a Jewish background. I'm not Jewish. I grew up in a evangelical church very similar to this one. Uh, in fact, a little bit dissimilar because we didn't have the Israeli flag uh, flying. Uh, Israel was not really a part of my childhood conversation. Uh, I went to Sunday school. I went to church. We were a church-going family. But uh, Israel, to me, might as well have been Paraguay. I mean, I had no connection, I had no background, I had no interest whatsoever. Um, graduated from high school, went to an Assembly of God college outside of Philadelphia called the University of Valley Forge. And went and did four years at the University of Valley Forge, did a degree in theology and a degree in music uh, at Valley Forge, and I was just preparing to live my life within the construct of being an Assembly of God minister and doing what Assembly of God pastors do. In my early 20s, uh, I got a, I saw an invitation, a, a brief notice to come and volunteer for a short-term program in Jerusalem. And I was kind of in between ministry assignments, and I had about six months where I kind of this one had ended and that one had not started, and so I had this period of time. I thought, well, that would be really interesting. Now, it wasn't really interesting to me because it was Israel. It was just something unusual to do, and I thought, I'm, gonna, I'm going to try that. And that journey changed my life. It changed the entire direction of my life, so that now, 30 years later, uh, I've been to Israel so many times I no longer count I would estimate I've probably been there about a hundred times. Um, got back about four weeks ago. I'm leaving again in about five weeks to go back. Um, I've brought about 20,000 people with me to Israel. Um, I've only lost a few. The, the great majority have come home. Uh, and, and every day of my life is spent in this amazing moment that we are living in where God is connecting the Jewish people and the Christian church globally as never before. And my assignment this morning, my responsibility, my job from the Holy Spirit, is to somehow take the seed of that reality and make sure that that seed is planted afresh in our hearts here this morning. It's going to be a mistake if we leave this morning and you say, oh yeah, that guy came in, he spoke about Israel. Yeah, that's nice for those people in the church who have that burden for Israel. You know those people. They like the fast songs in D minor. They bring Star of David tambourines, right? If you leave this service when we're done in about two hours, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to start preaching right up here because I've got an, this is my amen corner right here. So we're going to have church. <clears throat> if we leave and we leave with the understanding, oh yeah, that's, that's nice. You know, some people, some people have a burden for China and some people have a burden for the inner city and et cetera. And this one just has a burden for, we're going to miss the whole point. Because we wouldn't be here without Jews. The book that you hold in your hand or have on your iPhone or on your iPad, Moses, Isaiah, David, Gideon, Esther, Deborah, the Apostle Paul, not a Southern Baptist in the bunch. All of them Jews. The entire spiritual heritage that we have that gives our life purpose and structure and significance and meaning and hope comes from this people, the Jews. Now, 
I want to start by asking a question this morning, provoking us to think. And the question I want to ask us this morning is this. In a few hours from now, the Deputy Consul General is going to come down from Boston. The rabbi is going to come. Members of the Jewish community are going to come. And my first question to us this morning is this. Why are the Jews still here? Why are the Jews still here? Where are the Amorites? Where are the Hittites? You know, Pastor, you said we're going to have lunch when the service is over. I'd like to go, could you is there a nice Jebusite restaurant in town? All of these other people groups, these small tribal ancient people groups have been blown away by the winds of history. But somehow, tonight, the Jewish people, a tiny people group, less than 14 million Jews alive around the world today, a tiny people group, but a people group that has endured generation after generation, nation after nation, attack after attack, they are still here. How does that inform us? What does that say to us? How does that impact our lives and what do we do with that information and then I want to raise the question not only about the existence of the Jewish people which by the way and I've heard this story attributed to several but I'll, I'll go with the first one I heard which is Queen Victoria turned to her Prime Minister and she said Mr. Prime Minister could you prove to me somehow the existence of God and the Prime Minister turned and said your majesty the Jews. What I'm saying to us today, church, is that the reason that the Jewish people have been attacked and vilified and maligned and cast out for centuries, beloved, the existence of the Jewish people is the greatest reality check for the truth and the veracity of this book. Generation after generation, they have endured. Now in AD 70, the Roman Empire came through, destroyed the temple. The Jews lost their temple. They lost Hebrew as a spoken language. They were scattered to the four nations of the earth. That should have been the end. We never should have heard of them again. They should have been a small footnote in history. Scattered to 106 nations of the earth eventually. But there was a promise. And this prophet Amos, which I'm picking one verse of dozens if not hundreds. This prophet Amos looks down through the corridors of history by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and he says, they may be scattered, but that's not the end of the story. He says, there's coming a time. What time is that time? Somebody said it. Say it louder, whoever just said it. That day. Amos 9-11. In that day, God says he's going to do some things. What's he going to do? Verse 11, I will restore the tabernacle of David as it used to be. So curious. God could have chosen, he could have said, I'll restore the, 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 the order of Moses. I'll restore the prophetic anointing of Isaiah. All of these different patriarchs, matriarchs he could have chosen, but he said, no, David. Why? David had this amazing ability Despite his flaws and his weaknesses, he knew what gained God's heart and God's favor. David knew that if he would honor and maintain the presence of God in his midst, David was a worshiper. If he would maintain the presence of God in his midst, he knew that everything else would be taken care of. Harvest time, you've entered this new season, you've entered this new facility, and it wasn't easy. There were deadlines, there were budgets, there were codes. There were officials to be bribed. No, I'm kidding, I'm sorry. 
You had a whole process to get into this place. There was a whole thing to come into this. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful and glory to God. But can I tell you what I'm proud of you about most of all? I'm proud of you that when you enter this place and when God's people gather, the presence of God is still absolutely honored and ministered to in this house. If we lose the presence of God, you might as well write Kiwanis Club over the door. It is the presence of God that absolutely must be maintained at all costs. And that was what David understood. And God said there was something that rested on David that how David ministered to me and offered up fragrance to me that God says that I'm going to restore. When? In that day. God says I'm going to restore that anointing that rested upon David, but this time it's not coming on an individual named David, it's coming on a generation named David. And I want to say to you there is a new breed of Christian rising up in the world today that is not content with religious systems and religious traditions. They are longing and looking for the presence of God. And everywhere you go in the world, I'll be in nine nations this year. I've preached in 50 nations around the world. Everywhere you go in the world, what I find is that those who are hungry for the presence of God invariably connect to God's heart for Israel and the Jewish people. I find it all around the world. Last week we were in Manhattan. My dear friend Danny Dion, the Consul General, was with us. We hosted a reception. He came and honored us with his presence. And we saw the exact same thing we're going to see tonight. We saw Jews and Christians gathering together. The week before that, I was in Framingham, Massachusetts, with a Brazilian Portuguese group, 15 Portuguese-speaking churches, saying we want a Portuguese night to celebrate Israel. This day is that day. We have lived in 2,000 years where the Christian church has been largely separated and cut off both from the Jewish roots of our faith and from connection to the Jewish people. And that is being turned around in front of our eyes. It's a glorious and miraculous day. And the church will look at me sometimes and say, well, yeah, but you know, the Jews, you know, they don't believe about Jesus like we believe, etc., etc. I understand that. And the Apostle Paul addresses that. Paul says there is a veil over the eyes of the Jewish people that has allowed you and I Gentiles, who were strangers, what does the word say? We were the wild olive branch. We were outside the covenants of God, the word says. We've been grafted in. But church, we can talk about a veil over the eyes of the Jewish people, but could I submit to you something this morning? I believe there's been a veil over the eyes of the church. Jesus is not a Norwegian. We have served an American Jesus. People come to me and they say, well, Jesus was Jewish. I say, Jesus wasn't Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. <laughs> He's coming back Jewish to the Jewish state of Israel. Amen. And when we begin to understand that a Jewish man lives in our heart, and that we are a continuation of this covenant from Abraham, our faith father Abraham, who looked up and saw the stars and saw the sand. Beloved, I believe we were part of the stars he saw and the sand he saw because we've been grafted in by faith to this covenant, but not to the displacement of its original inhabitants, its original inheritance. And we're living in that day. God says in that day, I'll restore the tabernacle of David. Now glance down quickly, if you will, to verse 14 and 15. What does it say? It says that I will regather my people Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. Do you know what? The United Nations right down the road is yelling about and passing resolutions about and involved in every day. Verse 14. The settlements, the obstacles to peace. You know what it is? It's verse 14. 
It says they will make gardens, eat fruit. Every time I go to Israel and I have breakfast, I'm eating a prophecy. A nation has been reborn in a day. How many of you have been to Israel? Raise your hands if you've been to Israel. All right, how many of you have not been to Israel? Raise your hands. All right, we're going to have a moment of repentance right after the service. And then we'll take deposits at the back, all right? I think it's high time for harvest time to bring a trip to Israel again. I really think. <laughs> I didn't vote or anything. I just, yeah, I'll pay for that later. Every believer once in their life needs to visit the land of their faith. It should not be an option. It should not be, it should be a part of our faith. I have a personal vendetta when, my church knows this, this is kind of an ongoing thing that if I see families and they've not yet gone to Israel and I go on their Facebook and they're visiting the land of the mouse, I say, don't you tell me you can't afford to get to Israel when I see you with that mouse. You can go see the mouse after you've been to the Holy Land. Say that day. Say in that day. God says there's coming a moment where he interrupts history, where things change. We are living in that moment. We are living in a moment where a people who were scattered to 106 nations of the earth have been regathered against all odds. And we're living in a moment where bonds of friendship and connection are coming between Jews and Christians as never before. It's happening all around the world. It's happening every day. Two of my Wonderful staff members have joined me here this weekend. Uh, Dina De Pasquale is our events coordinator. She handles all of the logistics for our events here and around. Dina, just stand up real quick. Dina uh, heads up all of our logistics. Tonight, tonight is one of 16 Celebrate Israel nights that Eagles Wings is hosting from coast to coast this year. So 16 from Los Angeles to New York, uh, 16 Celebrate Israel events that Dina helps coordinate. And Pastor Joe Green is with us. Pastor Joe, would you stand up? Pastor Joe is our Senior Vice President of Development. <laughs> Pastor Joe pastored for 25 years the largest evangelical church in Rhode Island. And then he went to work for Pat Robertson, worked in the development area for, for Pat, uh, and then has joined the Eagles Wings team. But Pastor Joe and I have been friends for 30 years. Now, I want to take a moment, and I'm going to, use Pastor Joe's life as an illustration. Pastor Joe, 25 years in ministry, Assembly of God Church in Rhode Island, and we were dear friends. I preached for him back when I had hair. And we were, we were dear friends, and I preached for him several times. But somewhere, maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 15 years ago, kind of, and he didn't ever say this to me, but the thing was, wow, what is the deal with Stearns and that Israel thing? And he probably thought he must be Jewish or something, right? Now, if you asked Pastor Joe, are you pro-Israel? Is your church pro-Israel? He would have said yes. But it didn't mean anything. Faith without... So if you asked him that, he would have said yes, but it didn't mean anything. And, and Stern, Stearns was a little, I don't know what that is, that Israel thing. He's a little obsessed. See, we're correcting a 2,000-year-old wrong. And then about five years ago, six years ago, Pastor Joe decided to host a Celebrate Israel night. Still didn't really understand or get it all, but was willing to host the night. And so the church prepared, like Harvest Time's been preparing to host the event, put the word out, put it out in the community. And Pastor Joe drove to the office the next morning, got to the office, 
and all of the windows of the church had been shot out. Rocks thrown through them, gunfire through them. The doors of the church had swastikas painted all over them. And Pastor Joe is there, reporters are there from the Boston Globe. The word's going out around the news media. And all of a sudden, a car pulls up. A man gets out of the car. He has a kippah on, a yarmulke. And he walks up to Pastor Joe. Pastor Joe sees this rabbi. And the first words out of the rabbi's mouth to Pastor Joe, as they look at the damage, the rabbi says, Welcome to my world. And Pastor Joe says, that is the moment that the light switch went on. That's the moment that the light bulb went on. My prayer for all of us is that we'd realize that it's that day. We'd realize that something spectacular, unprecedented, prophetic, and profound is happening right in front of our very eyes. Now tonight, your neighbors, your Jewish friends, are going to do something that we don't understand how hard it is for them to do that. Why? Because 2,000 years of church history has not been so good for the Jews. Jews did far better under Muslim rule throughout history than they did under Christian rule. It's the reality of it. We don't know that story, but it's factually, historically accurate. But tonight, we've extended a hand of friendship to the Jewish people. We've said to the Jewish people, it's a new day. It's that day. Please come and walk with us. And the Jewish people are coming tonight. Not all of them, but many of them. And they're testing the waters of this. Can I ask you tonight, can I implore you, would you please prioritize being here tonight? It's important. It's important for all the reasons I've already mentioned, and it's important two months after Pittsburgh, when at Tree of Life Synagogue during a baby dedication ceremony, an anti-Semite walks through the door and slaughters 11 innocent Jews in a synagogue. It's important that the Jewish community in this region knows that they are not alone. Amen. And your attendance tonight is a direct statement. I will tell you, because I've been through this over and over and over and over and over again, Jewish people will be here tonight and they will be weeping and they will be saying, we never, ever knew anyone cared about us like this. That will happen a few hours from now. I want to invite you to prioritize it. You say, oh, yeah, but I got my kids. There's nothing better for your kids to experience than to, at a young age, understand that your family stands with the people of the book, the people of the covenant. We have checked all of the television listings. There's nothing on television today, nothing good. <laughs> God is extending an invitation to this house as you've entered this new facility that it not just be a physical transformation, but that you more fully step into that day. That the presence of God through the tabernacle of David would increase in this place. And that this house would become one of those houses that doesn't go the way of what I call the increasing American Jesus. Did I talk about that already, or was that last service? Wasn't that last service, or did I talk about it in this service? Last service? I'm going to talk about it again. We're living in a moment where much of the church is following an American Jesus. That's a sanitized Jesus. It's a Hallmark card Jesus. It's Jesus who loves and forgives and is happy and is friendly. What about Jesus who overturned the money changers? 
What about Jesus who said, I haven't come to bring peace but a sword? What about Jesus who said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to leave mother, sister, father. There's a battle in the soul of this nation. And there are false Christs that are abounding in our world. God needs an embassy for his kingdom in Greenwich, Connecticut that will stand clear and strong and give a resolute message. And that's what the Holy Spirit is bringing us to and bringing you to tonight. And so, beloved, as I close, and we're going to prepare to show you a brief video in just a moment. Amos 9, 11 to 15, I will bring back my captive people, Israel. And you and I are the generation that has seen that. That just blows my mind. We've seen this verse come to pass in our day. They'll rebuild the waste cities and live in them. They'll plant vineyards, drink wine, make gardens, eat fruit. I will plant Israel in her own land, never to be, never again to be uprooted from the land which I have given them. Not the land the United Nations has given them. Not the land friendship with America or the European Union has given them. The covenantal land that God promised to Abraham and his seed forever. Beloved, can I tell you this? The God of the Bible who has kept his promises to the Jewish people for 2,000, for, for, for 4,000 years since Abraham, the God of the Bible has proven his word over and over and over again. The God of this book who has not broken his promises to Israel is not going to break his promises to you and to his family. He who keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. He is a covenant-keeping God. And we gather around this mystery that's unfolding in front of our very eyes. And there's battle over it. There's intensity over it. Our university campuses are overrun with anti-Semitism right now. And Pastor Joe, I'm not picking on you. But this is a wonderful man of God who pastored for decades with a generalized pro-Israel feeling but there had to come the moment that it meant something. Church, I'm asking you today that today would be the beginning of it meaning something in greater and more profound ways in your life than it ever has before. Because the battle around that tiny nation, and more specifically, the tiny city of Jerusalem, and more specifically, the Temple Mount, is the battle for the future of humanity. And if, you, if, if all of this is just like, whoa, it's all right. But take a first step and say, God, I'm going to begin praying for Jerusalem. I'm going to begin listening. I'm going to begin understanding. And you'll see that unfold. It has been my privilege to be with you today and to reconnect with this beautiful church body. I want to invite you to come with me for a moment to Jerusalem. Eagles Wings has about a dozen different programs, initiatives, and outreaches that we run um, with our partners and churches all across the nation and around the world. And uh, we want to just highlight just one uh, of the many different um, outreaches that we engage in on a constant basis. I really look forward to seeing you tonight at 6 p.m. It's awesome to be back at harvest time. God bless you. times those of us in America are unaware that Israel faces some significant poverty issues. Uh, many of the new immigrants who come, uh, many of those who've come from the former Soviet Union or from Ethiopia, 
Many of them are struggling to make it here in the land. Uh, many of the Holocaust survivors came with, with no family, with no training, and now they're very old and they're endeavoring to make a life for themselves here. You and I together can reach out with the love of God in the name of Jesus and meet practical needs for these who are Jesus' family. These are Jesus' brothers and sisters. The Bible says, as much as you did it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, my brothers and sisters, these are the biological family of Jesus, and we're reaching out to them with love and compassion today, together through our partnership. and see that we're not only doing the tourist things, but we're coming here and we're doing practical things. It's so very meaningful, especially that a heart of a pastor is to be able to serve and to train others how to have that same kind of heart. Right. And to see it here, not only to feed the hungry, but to feed every need, every That's spiritual right. need, for whatever need that you have, whatever lacking. It's time for you to say, I want to be a part, not only of the idea of Israel, not only of the idea of what's happening in the Holy Land, but I want to do something real. I want to do something practical. You can do that by joining us on one of our pilgrimages, or you can do that by becoming a monthly partner and saying, I'm standing with Eagle's Wings. I'm standing with you in the work that you're doing in the land. Won't you prayerfully consider today joining with us and making a real difference? I came here from Denver, Colorado. That's where I grew up. I made Aliyah 15 years ago. Even though I have a master's in applied math, I could never get my Hebrew very good, so I never got good enough to really compete in the high-tech workforce. I come here as often as I can because it, it really is the best food around, for one thing. It's very nutritious. They somehow managed to get about 20 different vegetables into every meal. For those who support Eagle's Wings and, and for the Eagle's Wings organization, I, I really do thank you. It's, uh, it's how I get my food. You know? <laughs>